Amada, yes, can you? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming and joining us today. I'm very pleased to welcome you to the newest edition of the Author Book Talk. Our guest speaker is John Case, and I think John doesn't need any introduction. We all know him as an educator, as a person with a broad knowledge and wide range of interest, as as the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and the Interim Director of the School of Art and Design at the Hillier College of Architecture and Design. John holds a Bachelor of Science in Architecture from the University of the Arts and a Master of Architecture degree from Princeton University. As a professional experienced in different areas of design in 2001, John co-founded Great Architects and Architecture and Interior Design Firm in New, York, in New York City. Prior to that, John worked as the project manager at Robert Storing Architect. And since 2002, he holds his appointment at NJIT. John contributed his time and effort to various professional associations, including his service as the Northeast Regional Director for the Associate Association of the Collegiate Schools of Architecture, ACSA, from 2014 to 2017, and as a director of the National Architectural Accrediting Board and NAD from 2017 to 2020. Today, John presents his monograph, An Environmental Life Cycle Approach to Design, LCA for Designers and the Design Market. I don't have this book in hand to show you, but you can access it via the library catalog it's available at electronic format. This book published by Springer Fairlock in Switzerland just a month ago can already be found in libraries in the US, Canada, Spain, Netherlands, Japan, United Kingdom, and Australia. It is a result of several years of John's scholarly pursuit and a reflection of his view of the design of the critical role of design in the complex world we live in. Based on the most recent scientific research, it discusses global challenges to which LCA can help to find solutions. Yes, this is a taxable event for you. Right. Uh, yes. John uses a broad range of data and no, reference I mean, that would points. be the only other factor now. Uh, you know, Tony, please mute. Um, John used a broad range of data and reference points related to such design issues as sustainability, technology and adaptive reuse. He also draws into other areas like physics, chemistry, psychology, history, and consumer behavior. This makes his research appealing not only to a narrow group of professionals, but also to a wide range of general readers. This well-crafted work makes it difficult to understand concepts more accessible. It also demonstrates creative ways to visualize rather abstract and complex data. The inclusion of detailed information on the LCA methodology, available instruments, as well as case study, should help designers to make more informed decisions. It also provides their clients with ways to join them in better understanding, framing, and solving everyday problems. And now, I welcome John and the Book of John. Thank you very much, Maya. I, I want to express my sincere thanks to everyone who has put this uh, event together. I wish we were able to deliver this brief presentation and discussion to you in the Michael Mostel reading room. I look forward to someday soon when we all gather there again to enjoy hot tea and Russian cookies. Uh, thanks also to Charvel Sarkis for designing this lovely poster announcing today's event. I often crow about our faculty and students in public, but I rarely get to thank you all directly. Nothing arises absent the right conditions. This book traces some of the key forces that create and exacerbate our present ecological situation. I hope you'll indulge me as I read a few passages from the book throughout the presentation that will serve to give you a sense of what's in it. I start by acknowledging the conditions that allowed it to exist at all from the acknowledgements. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to my colleagues at the New Jersey Institute of Technology and the Hilliard College for creating an atmosphere of free inquiry. To Dean Erz Goshat, who first encouraged me to look into the topic of life cycle assessment and how it might benefit the world in the hands of designers. He insisted that I set aside dedicated time each day to learn and write about the topic to help, uh, to help make the planet better for my daughter, her friends, and their children. 
to Dean Tony Schumann, who continues to serve as an example of an activist scholar, to Dean Branko Kolarovic, who enthusiastically made sure I completed the mission, to Provost Fadi Deek, who all, always gave me uh, gentle encouragement to persist in writing the first book. Special thanks go out to David Brothers, Martina Decker, Christine Liakos, Darius Solahub and Andrei Zarziki for their interest in the subject of LCA in design and their perennial invitations to me uh, to introduce it in their uh, design uh, to their design students. Also to Glenn, Glenn Goldman, who encouraged me to think broadly, be curious and to see the vital connections between design and technology. To Maya Gerbitz, who could always anticipate my questions and needs uh, on which library resources would best lead me to fertile areas of exploration. Also, for the generous support she provided with library resources on extended loan. To all the design students in my classes over the years who asked honest and earnest questions to learn and practice how to back up their sustainable design claims. And to the skeptical ones who needed to dig deeper to know how we know what we know about our individual and collective impact on this living world. I especially want to thank Aaron Heidelberger who followed farther than any Hillier design student and tenaciously persisted in an entire year of rich and challenging dialogue. She appeared at the perfect time in her own soft-spoken but determined way to make meaningful contributions to this book. She is on her way to help design make a measurable difference. I started researching this topic when my daughter was born over 10 years ago, but it was only after offering LCA classes to, to design students in 2013 that I realized what the, the real challenge was. Students want to design better, more ecologically res uh, responsive product systems, but their enthusiasm wanes quickly when confronted with a bunch of technical language required to back up their sustainable uh, claims. Before learning technical facts and methods for students to use life cycle thinking to improve the environmental, uh, environmental impact uh, and uh, profiles of their designs, I found that I had to first carefully present the problems before discussing approaches to address them. We humans have been recording our activities in the world for approximately 30,000 years. Much of this time was spent without negatively impacting the natural world through industry. In the last trillion seconds of human civilization, only the last 10 billion seconds or so have impacted the environment on a global scale. Some refer to this as a new age as the Anthropocene. We as designers can have a positive impact on the problems we face as we provide for a growing number of people, all striving for a better lives for themselves and those they care about. Our industrial economy has supported orders of magnitude growth in global population. Understanding and engaging in conversations around means and methods of industrial production, designers can have clear roles and responsibilities in how to mitigate our collective environmental impacts. It is why I wrote this book. The book was originally pissed, uh, uh, pinched, <laughs> pitched simply as a life cycle approach to design, LCA for designers and the design market, with the same subtitle, LCA for designers and the design market. After writing, uh, after writing it though, I decided to add the qualifier in environmental to distinguish it from the other life cycle assessment types. There's an, on, uh, a, a growing field of social life cycle assessment, for example, which is certainly beyond the scope of this work. Environmental life cycle assessment narrowly bounds its concerns to only one third of the sustainability triple bottom line that balances people, planet, and prosperity. Setting reasonable boundaries around environment can help to tame the wicked problems inherently uh, present in sustainability studies. It is also helpful to focus on what we can know and ultimately control as designers. The book's nine chapters can be divided into three main sections. The first part discusses how we got into the situation we find ourselves in. The second, what our collective responses have been once the crisis uh, became clear. And the third part goes into how designers can integrate new life cycle assessment methods and tools into their design workflows. I present energy as the root cause of the crisis and present ways for designers to understand what it, what it is and how it affects absolutely every consideration regarding climate change. Our deep dependency on fossil fuels 
and the inherent qualities that make them easy to use and hard to replace compound the numerous practical challenges to develop uh, clean, high density forms of energy. Coal, oil, and natural gas have unique combinations of portability, compactness, high energy concentration, and relative stability that are well matched with human needs and habits. The easiest to reach fossil fuel stores are already depleted. Challenges and extraction continues, uh, continue to grow, but new technical means and methods have kept pace to increase uh, output of these finite resources. I start by explaining the basic energy unit and how it was established. For instance, James Prescott Joule was a 19th century British physicist who explored the relationship between heat and work. In a series of experiments carried out between 1845 and 1847, Joule used three custom-built instruments to precisely measure the subtle temperature rise from the friction caused by gravity-driven small paddles rotating through a vessel filled with water. The Joule apparatus, which you see here, um, experiments demonstrated the direct mechanical transfer of diminishing gravitational potential energy as a string connected to a descending weight spun the bearing mounted brass paddle shaft to proportionally increase internal heat energy in the water. This early experimental proof of the conservation of energy was, according to Joule, carried out in a spacious cellar, which had the advantage of possessing a uniformity of temperature and recorded the results to one two hundredth of a degree Fahrenheit. For his contributions to the field of thermodynamics, the international standard base unit of energy in any form is the joule. One human scaled example of the amount of energy measured in a single joule is the work done by lifting an apple with a mass of a bit over 100 grams off the floor to a height of one meter. But energy itself is difficult to define. Since the 19th century, we have described energy indirectly as units of work. In his lecture on the conservation of energy, the Nobel laureate Richard Feynman states, as a matter of fact, that we have no knowledge of what energy is. We do not have a picture that energy comes in little blobs of definite amounts. Energy is a word that describes the potential of abstract physical forces to transform a system. The language scientists and engineers use to discuss its practical effects deal largely with an, uh, an accepted understanding of the relationship between units of force, energy, and power. The work that is accomplished uh, takes pl uh, place in space over time. Wilhelm Oswald's uh, Fundamentals of General Energetics begins by identifying energy as a phenomenon as fundamental as that of time and space. The concepts that find application in all branches of science involving measurements are space, time, and energy. The significance of the first two has been accepted without question since the time of Kant. That energy deserves a place beside them follows from the fact that because of the laws of its transformation and its quantitative conservation, it makes possible a measurable relation between all domains of natural phenomena. Its exclusive right to rank along space and time is founded on the fact that besides energy, no other general concept finds application in all domains of science. Whereas we look upon time as unconditionally flowing and space as unconditionally at rest, we find energy appearing in both states. In the last analysis, everything that happens is nothing but changes in energy. Experience shows that the decrease of energy at one place is always associated with an equal increase somewhere else. Essentially, if, a, if Cartesian space is 3D and the whole of the um, indefinite progression of, um, of existence and events from past to present and into the future is 4D, that energy can be considered as an AD or all dimensional phenomenon. Other terms are helpful to define what we mean. Exergy, for example, describes the portion of, it, of an energy source that does actual work. Energy is the portion of energy that uh, exists as, weight heat, as waste heat. Entropy is a concept that grounds the entire field of thermo thermodynamics, which underpins the 18th and 19th century industrial revolution. With these and other key concepts regarding energy, uh, designers can begin to consider what the deeper implications are among several design alternatives. Chapter three outlines global environmental impacts that 200 years of industrial productions have brought. The main impact categories LCA assesses include air quality impacted by increasing tropospheric ozone or smog, 
greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere, organic nutrient loading in our fresh and coastal waters, and stratospheric ozone depletion potential that strips away the natural protection our atmosphere provides from the sun's harmful UV radiation. I also discussed the magnitude of our global impact in the form of solid waste, since it is the one clearly visible and easily measured uh, form uh, per, uh, per, capita, per capita marker. The influential artist and filmmaker Chris Jordan gave me permission to include one of his photographs in my book. This series of photographs powerfully illustrate the impact our consumption has on our closed ecosphere. Each one of these colorful plastic pieces was fed to this albatross chick by its parent, mistaking it for nutritious food. Each plastic piece was designed, manufactured, and used by a human being. I explore the earliest roots of the life cycle concept in the mid 20th century uh, US military industrial complex. I use historical documents to show how it was uh, eventually uh, migrated to corporate use in the 1960s and 70s, and then was distilled and transformed by a group of dedicated scientists into the rigorous environmental assessment method used today. The last half of the book discusses life the life cycle inventory databases used to feed geometric design modeling software. I emphasize the resources available to the North American market. We still lag behind many European and Asian countries. We, as designers, need to do a better job to effectively use these LCA methods and tools to measure, assess, and mitigate our environmental impact. The last three chapters are written to show how LCA can be directly applied to improve design decision making. Chapter 9 compares various approaches to modeling and the level of detail included in uh, different scenarios. One of the main takeaways is that it doesn't matter so much how you conduct a study as how consistent you are when you are comparing results. The main point is that is that the approach proves trustworthy and consistent, provided the design tools and results from design studies are not arbitrarily compared. So I, I wanted to give you the basic um, uh, overview of the book. Um, I would be happy to discuss it more and answer questions that you might have about it. Um, but I, I did want to, again, thank you all for creating the conditions that allowed it to exist. So, um, you know, if you, if, I mean, some of you have had conversations with me about this, but others might have questions about still what is life cycle assessment and how can uh, designers really use it? So I, I'm, uh, I'd like to open the, uh, the floor to questions. Uh, John, uh, this is this is us, and uh, 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 delighted to uh, see the book in its full glory. And I remember the beginning of our conversations about writing a book on this subject. And it seems to me that at the time you said, uh, "This is really uh, written for my daughter with the next generation in mind." And they can do better than we did, and that uh, than our parents did. So, uh, how is this book going to impact your daughter Sarah or her generation? I mean, you've given us a, a very technical, uh, marvelous explanation of what is in this book. But uh, how does this? I mean, if you were to rewrite this book, the children's book, what would you put in it, and how would that change the course of events? Uh, in the future? Well, you're still asking me these questions. Uh, so <laughs> I appreciate that or so much. Um, in fact, I have thought about writing this as a child children's book. And the, the, I found that the, uh, it gets harder and harder the more simple you make the language. So I worked pretty hard at, at, uh, at boiling down some of the technical language. Yes, there's still some technical language in there. The, the way that I see it, though, is um, these techniques, this way of thinking about um, looking at resources, how we deploy them and make new things, uh, and what happens to those things throughout their, their life, uh, you know, in our uh, you know, benefiting us, um, those kinds of, of issues are technical issues. Um, the, the challenge for designers is they got into this, into this game for reasons other than uh, you know, those that engineers get into it or scientists get into it. 
we want to make things. We want to design things. We want to make the world uh, beautiful. We want to make the world um, uh, function well. All these things. Uh, we don't necessarily want to uh, to do detailed analyses. So the way that I would um, I have framed this uh, this work in each of the chapter is uh, chapters is is uh, to give designers ways to approach the fundamental issues, understanding the concepts, and then give them the tools and techniques to build into their sort of native, natural, um, organic workflows. For instance, we have um, all of these software packages that, that uh, designers use from SolidWorks to Revit uh, at, at different scales. Um, we have tools that allow designers to, to run analyses on their different, uh, their different um, alternatives that they, that they run. But each of these, these tools takes kind of a, a step away from the design process. So you design something, then you analyze. So what I'm working on right now uh, is a way to, um, to unify all of these, these pieces. So the next book, uh, in fact, which we were already talking about with the American uh, Center for Lifecycle Assessment, uh, is really focused on uh, reducing the friction of all of the, the data that goes into these considerations. So how it would affect Sarah is the designers in this generation will be e more easily um, informed by this other set of data sources. Those kinds of, of workflows are really critical to, uh, I think, the improvement of, of the next generation of designed uh, uh, product systems. I use the word product system because that, it, it, that term encompasses small things, large things, uh, systems that, that don't necessarily have a physical um, manifestation, like, like a glass or a book or a shoe or a building. Um, but to understand thinking that uh, whatever we're manifesting requires energy, requires matter, uh, requires information, and the judi judicious use of all of those is, uh, I think, the thing that will make or break our, our future. So as we lower the, the barriers to integrating these workflows into tools and techniques that designers use, I think um, the world stands a better shot at uh, at improving its uh, its uh, overall um, environmental impact. But the children's book, it's really coming down to starting with natural resources. What are we digging out of the ground? What are we chopping down? What are we growing? Uh, and what goes into manifesting those things? What is the is the rich store? That we are are spending down right now, uh, the mineral wealth, the plant wealth, the uh, the natural resources that we have on the planet are finite, and we're going to have to um, build different relationships to them. Um, I know that uh, that uh, Tony Schumann brought in a a, a friend um, to speak about the circular economy. Um, Walter Stile uh, spoke very eloquently on that. Uh, that topic, and that's one way of looking at uh, sort of making one one process's waste into another process's feedstock. Um, the interesting thing that I found out in in looking at say circular economy, though through the life cycle assessment lens, is that not all uh, circular processes are the best processes. So it's really looking at at each um, approach in and of itself. And, and bounding it properly so that they, that they can be compared. So a linear process is not inherently worse than a circular process. Often it is, but not always. So it's, again, expanding the boundaries, the language that designers can use to interface with other groups, uh, to learn some you know, basic languages of science, uh, not be afraid of it, um, not be afraid of the metric system, not be afraid of, um, of words like eutrophication and acidification. Those things are not inherently um, uh, sc scary and once you get used to them. Uh, but it, w when you first, I think, approach them, they can be a bit daunting to the designer.
So, John, let me jump in. You know, you you haven't really given us your definition of the life cycle um, assessment, uh, and you haven't really spoken about the kind of challenges in your work. So, I just wanted to ask you if you can give us your definition of life cycle assessment, because there are many that I've seen out there. And again, what was the principal challenge that you encountered in, in, in writing this book? So, an environmental life cycle assessment is different from, say, a social uh, life cycle assessment. I, I, I tried to bracket it in terms of um, making it clear that it's only dealing with certain set of of, uh, of conditions and um, and looking only at those things that impact the environment. Uh, there is a broad set uh, set of, of sustainable studies that really look at, at people, planet, and profit. Um, this one environmental life cycle assessment just deals with those uh, impact categories that can be measured um, either by a midpoint or endpoint uh, set of, of criteria. So what I mean by that is um, what we do, how we manifest things in the world all come from uh, the transformation of natural resources into through industrial processes and then uh, through a market given to people who use and then discard. So those are essentially the, the uh, life cycle stages. The book itself goes into a, um, a very detailed uh, discussion of exactly what the life cycle uh, phases are. Um, I mean, if it might be helpful to go back to one of the slides, I can do that. So the, the picture on um, our left is essentially a, a diagram showing the standard um, uh, way that life cycle assessment is described in the profession. Can you make that bigger? I Sorry. don't know. Let's see if I can. Um, yeah, great. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, for instance, life cycle assessment as, um, as a process, as a, um, a study is a technical 1. it's not 1 that uh, that designers typically uh, carry out and it's I'm, not, I'm in no way. Um, hoping that designers are going to become uh, LCA experts. Um, it re requires a separate set of skills uh, and 1 that, uh, you know, is usually the, the. The domain of economists, scientists, engineers, and uh, people who really deal with the with the fundamental issues of of measurement unit and uh, and boundary conditions. However, there are some things that uh, in the in say looking at the now can you see my cursor? So goal and scope definition, inventory analysis, impact assessment, interpretation. These are iterative steps in a the life cycle assessment process. So, some of these things go very well uh, with the design process. Goal and scope definition, for instance, is an iterative uh, exercise that uh, that asks us to come up with something called a functional unit, which is what am I going to be? What's the point? What is the problem I'm trying to solve? So this is something that I think is very helpful for designers, for instance, who some of whom like to design a solution in search of a problem. That's not what. LCA does LCA just defines a problem and then looks um, looks to analyze the, the issue. When we're combining it with design LCA can, uh, I think, be a, a complementary exercise. So goal and scope definition, for instance, uh, deals with what is the boundary condition of this of the design system or the product system that you're looking at if you're designing a shoe. Uh, what are the materials that go into the shoe? Um, what are the, um, what are the, um, what are the data sources that you're using? How, um, what is the provenance of, of that data? Is it good? Is it, is it new enough? Is it numerous enough? Is it, um, does it allow, uh, for people to, uh, to get a really accurate, uh, view of, of the thing that they're studying and also. Alternatives to that that one solution. So the, the scope definition deals with how large is this uh, is this question, 
Uh, and the goal is, is really what is the, the point of in life cycle assessment studies? What is the point of the study? Uh, what is the goal? Who is the audience? All of these things. Design does similar things in, uh, in uh, establishing what it is that, that it's about. Uh, inventory analysis in the second uh, bubble here is really just looking at the data. Uh, what are what are the data that are available? And it's uh, one of the things that is a it's a, uh, a phase unto itself that is um, a much larger treatment of the one that was uh, initially proposed in the first uh, goal and scope definition phase. And then once you have uh, established a reasonable set of, of data, and you can say, you can point to this is what the um, the data show about uh, or describe about your processes, then you can say, okay, let's see, are they correct? And if they're not, then you go back to the goal and scope definition and iterate again. And then impact assessment uh, brings into a third phase, what happens after you have come up with a reasonable inventory of data, um, and then you assess it uh, based on either midpoint, which is say, for instance, how much carbon dioxide equivalents are uh, emitted into the atmosphere based on a particular um, kind of industrial process. That would be a midpoint category. What, how, how many tons of that? Um, it doesn't say, what will the temperature rise to if we continue to do this. That's an endpoint or consequential um, uh, approach to uh, the use of LCA, which is fine, but it's usually not what we as designers are, are charged with uh, uh, considering. So in each case, the interpretation phase is, um, is critical. And um, in that way, I think it, it is iterative in the same way design is iterative. So defining what LCA is, is helpful when we compare it to what design is um, and those two systems as they kind of come closer together and integrate one into a, um, into the workflow of the other. I, I wonder if that <clears throat> answers your question. It, it does, but <clears throat> what I know about the challenges related with, with LCA, LCA is in this kind of second step where you talk about inventory analysis that you really have to make some educated guesses as to what the what what some of the kind of things that you're trying to quantify uh, are and what are the the way in which you're kind of quantifying them are adequate or not to the issue at hand so then at the end when you're doing the impact assessment you do it with a certain degree of certainty and you Correct. have to kind of define that margin margin of error so it's a kind of very uh, inaccurate way of of assessing the impact of, of things around us so the issue of of, um, of certainty or uncertainty, this is a this is a whole study in and of itself for life cycle assessment experts. Uh, they often talk about uh, what are we going to, how do we how do we um, uh, quantify the uncertainty? How do we say, well, this is a really good study. This is not such a good study. Um, as as you're dealing with the options and, and the different ways of of um, you know, considering what you're, what's available to you, you see all of these particular kinds of, um, of inventories. Uh, you look at their provenance, you look at their quality, um, and you can say, you can, quant you can basically give it, a, you can qualify it through a quantitative method. Some of those are um, uh, Monte Carlo simulations, all the, the different ways of looking at um, the way that these things will produce a, a, a quantity or a number, a, some kind of measure. Um, the way that I approach it for designers, again, we're not trying to create uh, LCA experts. We are taking those existing inventories that, and this was a, a challenge, but the, the solution is also uh, present today in our tools. And for instance, uh, the, the plug-in to Revit from Tally, from Kieran Timberlake, uh, that developed this tool in, uh, in concert with Autodesk, as well as with one of the world's largest uh, LC lifecycle inventory providers, uh, a company called Sphera. These, um, these tools have a, a sort of baked-in set of inventory. So irrespective of which tool you're using, you're not, as a designer, necessarily going into um, 
querying individual points within the inventory. It is an enormous kind of, of undertaking if you were to do that. So to take that out of the, of the kind of uh, challenge for the designer is to liberate the designer and maybe give the designer a bit more confidence that they can use the, the tools at hand. The way I, I address the, the next question I think that, that comes from that is, well, how do you know that the tools are, are really uh, giving you the right uh, information? We looked at, uh, at several different um, uh, tools. In fact, I can use some of these. Um, here are the relationships between the LCI databases, as well as some of the both uh, LCA tools built for um, uh, LCA experts, as well as those who are that are that are just interfaced in the design process. And then we, uh, for instance, um, compared one-click LCA uh, tally. Um, we looked at Athena uh, as different ways of, of querying a particular design um, scenario. And then we compared to see if those, uh, if those tools would yield something that is generally in agreement with each other. So the tools we find are in agreement. The individual uh, values from each assessment, those vary but they vary proportionally. So they all kind of go up and down at the same time. And that's the, so un, once you understand what's behind LCA, then you have that, that, uh, that question that you asked about uncertainty. Well, sure, we're not, this is not about giving the answer. It's about giving an informed set of, uh, of pieces of information that allow the designer to consider what the impacts of different design alternatives are. Does that make sense? It does. Thanks, John. I have more questions. We'll let others ask. Okay, Andre. Hey, thank you, John. Um, I'll be more a philosophical question, uh, but first I would like to thank you for being an excellent reviewer for TAR on life cycle assessment. And uh, really, I always see those reviews and I see who is um, putting how much energy and thought to those. And you are really on the top of the review. Oh, thank you. Just, thank just you. on this aspect. But philosophically, it's maybe a little bit uh, framing with Branco. Uh, I actually see this as a kind of pretty uh, uh, precise way, uh, but it's more resigning in a kind of prob probabilistic science like medicine or social. So it's not physics as, uh, you know, mechanics, but I think it's, but there's still some kind of questions for me about methodology because a, it is, I think, ultimately will be reliable based on a, size of data set and understanding of tools, but it may give us a certain um, misdirection in a sense that we trust because it works in many ways. And in your example, you uh, lecture, you focus uh, a lot of on energy. Obviously, I know you talk about uh, carbon, um, carbon sequestration and so on, but there's, how do you analyze things across multiple categories and it's not like looking at design and looking two designs have different um, carbon footprint or different energy footprint uh, this goes to a third example you know this because we discuss this often it's our policy from 10 years ago when we shifted from tungsten uh, light bulbs to compact fluorescent instead of waiting for leds and we saved uh, energy and carbon but we introduced a lot of uh, mercury to the air because only we had 10% of um, recycling of compact fluorescent lights. So how do we evaluate across different scenarios, not energy scenarios, not carbon scenarios, but uh, against carbon versus energy versus mercury versus uh, some other comments, like your favorite example is the fire retardants <laughs> that talk to the um, HPDs, how do we, do this because right now with a focus on energy and carbon, we may be uh, over kind of skipping bigger issues. That's my, my, so how do the life cycle goes laterally, not forward and backwards as a time, but uh, laterally as, as a very different, how we compare mercury versus carbon. Right. So, and this is the, 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 I think the, the greatest, um, uh, contribution that LCA as a discipline brings to that conversation. You're asking exactly the right question. I, I framed my talk in terms of energy 
because that is the is the fundamental thing, irrespective of which impact categories we're, we're really considering. Energy is at the root. So, for instance, mercury that you bring up, the mercury in these complex compact fluorescent uh, light bulbs also exists in coal, right? I mean, the, the kinds of, of, of toxicity, ecotoxicity, these are values that are that that are actually arrayed not f forward and backward, but but laterally. Uh, that can be compared. They cannot. None of these can be compared uh, one to one. Say which is which is the worst thing in the world. That's that's your real question. Uh, which is? The I think they can. Uh, my theory is that they can be compared with HPDs. That HPD is another dimension on the axis, multidimensional. So we look at the human. Half impact cancer rates. So that's kind of my my private a uh, kind of. So, but the way that that it is handled in LCA, for instance, by the experts, is through normalization. And so the the way that uh, these kinds of of um, heterogeneous categories are then compared one to the other, apples to apples to oranges to bananas to elephants. Um, is uh, is a way of uh, giving a value based on a value judgment. So you're saying that I I care about say stratospheric ozone depletion potential, right? Versus um, greenhouse gas emissions versus eutrophication potential. Those three things are very different things. However, they exist in the framework. It's up to us to say which things when we look, especially at design, when we're saying. I'm looking at these alternatives and I see the, these values jumping around as I, as I run them through the filtration of these different LCI and LCIA tools um, as we're dealing with the, the plugins to the different uh, geometric data. So the, the non-geometric metadata are the things that are driving and the, and the values through that that you're talking about through, um, through these probabilistic kind of modeling uh, techniques. Those are things that are moving these these different um, uh, values up and down. It's for us to say, I care more about environmental toxicity than I do about uh, carbon, or I care about carbon in the short term and environmental toxicity in the long term. Each one of these things points to the, I think, the fundamental issue around LCA and design that it is not an automatic kind of, of procedure. It gives you some insight but it is up to the human being to interpret and to ultimately say, which value judgment are you going to apply to making the decision? This design is better than that design in that kind of lateral matrix of, of different um, of choices. So once, once you figure out what it is that you really care about or your client really cares about, maybe you do want to. In fact, um, most of the, of the heat that I've gotten about this is that I don't really go into uh, that I don't give primacy to carbon. I, it is one among many. And, uh, and I think that the other thing by looking at energy uh, production, once you, once you figure out how to kind of green the grid, right? Then you could live in a, a screened in porch, basically in, in the middle of Boston. And you could, you know, just turn the, the heat on. So you're com so you feel comfortable. Once you have that kind of, of uh, energy throughput, that is not predicated on on carbon uh, fossil fuel rich uh, sources. At that point, it becomes a different. Pro is it perfect? It's not perfect because there are other trade offs because of all the all the uh, the mineral mining that has to go into photovoltaic cells, the production of wind turbines, all the kinds of other um, green uh, energy infrastructure that that is going to eventually uh, take, pl uh, take the place of, of the carbon infrastructure. So the, the issue of energy is always uh, there because it, it, as it manifests, it is setting into motion all of these different kinds of, of environmental impacts, uh, and the categories that we're measuring across, but the, the, the framework, the LCA framework is robust enough and broad enough and balanced enough that it can consider all of these things simultaneously, but we give different value judgments to which, which um, impact categories are the most significant in any, any particular um, uh, design system or product system. Thank you. Good question, <laughs> as always.
Anybody else? Bronco, you had some other questions that, that uh, I think you wanted to ask. I did, but I want to give others a chance to speak. So. Okay. Hi, JR. Hi, John. How you doing? Good to see you. Same here. Uh, again, the uh, previous comments, the way, my, the way we went about dressing the uh, compact for us and some LED fixtures was about 15 years ago, we were only installing compact for us since where the lamp could be replaced and an LED fixture could be installed, knowing that th this technology was going to be available within within the rise in five to you know we thought five to ten years and it was much earlier than that. So I think you, looking at that methodology, and if you have the foresight of the information beforehand, we were able to, to address it that way. So I think that's I think it's important to be able to get you know this information into as you know as many hands as possible, and also make it in such a manner as someone like my help myself is in a small private practice to be able to implement it. And so, Chair, the, the, the good news is that um, the the way that these tools are going to develop in the next I'd say five years, um, it's going to be staggering. I think uh, I've been having conversations with folks at NVIDIA. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a hunch that you know the the relationship between geometric data and some of the the uh, design software tools that we as designers use uh, can be augmented in a much more robust and uh, and much faster way uh, by the um, non geometric metadata around LCI and as those things flow in, the cost comes down, the effort comes down, the time comes down and sort of running these simulations in real time. Um, you know, the, one of the people who kind of also was a, was a North Star was Ed Masria and the Architecture 2030 uh, discussions around, uh, it's back in 2008 when I heard him talk about um, the requirement, the, the hopeful requirement that every student would have a, a basic little readout, a real time readout in the corner of their screen uh, that is telling them exactly how the, how their their design alternative is performing environmentally. Now that's a that's a big tall order, and it's you know it lacks detail. However, that's the right the general right approach I think to to give designers that kind of real time in, input, so they're not kind of stopping running a report reading these with all these numbers. Just tell me which one. If I tell you which thing I care about the most, if I care about environmental toxicity and mercury, tell me how my design is or isn't uh, impacting that in a positive way. Uh, that's that's kind of what I, I think we as designers have to keep in mind. So the, the big question is, what do we want to make? What techniques are we using to evaluate the, the relative benefits of one uh, solution over another? Uh, and how do we... Um, how do we work this so that it's not breaking the bank so that our clients don't walk away saying eh, i'm not really that interested in an in environment you know when it comes to by comparison to time and, and money you know because that's really what, what drives still drives most of these conversations so as we bring the, the costs down even small practitioners like you will be able to benefit from these these tools and and methods and then also with those tools, always the question is who's paying for the reports and are they weighted, being weighted in a certain way? There's always, you know, the infamous final siding being lead, as an example, uh, you know. Uh, so I think those are the things that, you know, we almost wish it was some sort of national, you know, uh, again, some sort of a value system given to products. So, you know, there's some validity. It's not something being, you know, again, you know, i.e. the uh, the doctors, you know, uh, testifying to the cigarette manufacturers or, or the acting, or the scientists, you know, probably their, their children, you know, testifying for the oil companies. I mean, so how do we know that the information we're getting is, is, is true? Yep. And so the issue of fact, the issue of, of uh, uh, real news, not fake news, these, these are, again, fundamental philosophical issues dealing with what is true, what do we know, what don't we know, how can we prove it, how do we qualify what we know. And that's the great thing that I see about LCA and lifecycle inventory data. Those things are, are extremely well documented, well qualified. So each one of these things, each one of these, um, uh, these strands of proof or, or a reason uh, supports the other 
other pieces. Now, if you want to say, well, how do you know that? I don't believe you. Uh, okay, the whole thing goes out the window. But And this is kind of what I was uh, faced with from the, uh, the first classes of students that I was dealing with. They say, how do you know that? And I had to say, well, let me go find out. And, and so in finding out, I, I mean, I, I am convinced that the, the, the general methodologies used are sound in at the at the root and it's at this root that flows into these tools that gives me confidence that that we can uh, depend on on the results that that uh, come out of the, the software queries and i guess the last question john would be you know if, i think if you have the base of understanding then you can you know again figure it out yourself you're basing it on the knowledge the knowledge base you have and not someone just giving you a number so then back to your book hopefully your book helps up with that you know it's okay you know that's that's the hope yes yes i mean and then then someone has a a, a more of a, 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 a an understanding of the material and not just looking at a number that, that's a, for them it's just a random number that you exactly else. so to contextualize that's the other thing that's the other role of the designer the designer is basically a super consumer uh, the, the consumer LCA is, by the way, not a tool for consumers. It's not really built for that. Uh, but the designer is a, is in a position to be the super consumer because a they they specify enormous amounts of material. So the material flows that they're choosing can be mindfully um, uh, constructed in a way that lowers negative uh, environmental impacts. Um, and then also the the second role, as I would say, is as an interpreter and to, to go to the client saying, this is good, better, and best. There aren't any bad ones. So if, if you run these, these simulations through the tools, you can find you know, all of these kinds of, of solutions that, that are generally okay. Some might be better, some might be you know, marginally better on one impact category or another, but generally you can kind of get a sense that this is not going to do um, severe damage to ecosystems in, in any of the impact categories. Thank you. Thank you. Tarek. Um, uh, hi, John, how are you? I'm fine, thank you, how are you? Good, thanks. Um, interesting book, and it was great to see um, the design, uh, uh, you know, you have, you know, the LCA has been around for a while, for a long time, but seeing a specific book about, you know, targeting design and designers is really interesting. Uh, I can see you deliberately avoiding, uh, avoid using the the uh, the term embodied energy kind of, uh, you know, throughout. And um, so I just wanted to know your thought about this and, um, uh, you know, it's how it's hard to, I'm just going to talk about education, uh, just teaching basic uh, uh, building kind of uh, energy uh, operational energy stuff to students. So, um, so what do you think about? Uh, are there any priorities, and or we should should we just leave it open uh, in terms of importance and in terms of in environmental impacts of uh, of, of buildings, uh, and uh, or should we uh, have kind of a list of priorities, or or we'll just leave it open to everyone to see what kind of uh, category uh, uh, they think it's more more important to consider uh, in their design. So I did I did uh, avoid the discussion of embodied energy, uh, also energy memory. I, br I bring up the issue of energy uh, briefly just to address that that yes, there is this other other kind of accounting system that just deals with energy memory accounting, uh, which is is I mean if if you think um, LCA is rarefied, the energy conversation is way out there, um, but it's still it's reasonable and valid. I think that if my own approach is looking at envi embodied environmental impact in general, and, and embodied energy is one of those things, but I think it the larger boundary condition is the environmental impact. So if, if what we wanted to say is once we did this study, we decided embodied energy or primary um, energy resources um, were the thing that we wanted to optimize for, then we can. But I think the my at least my approach is to present this as a as a balanced way of dealing with multiple criteria um, and looking at uh, at giving designers the tools and the wherewithal to make those those value judgments later on. So one designer might say embodied energy is the is the whole show. 
The others might say, absolutely not. It has to be, we have to really look at the local issues around water or land use. Each one of these things has a, a different set of metrics, uh, but the, the framework of LCA, and this maybe goes to, to Bronco's question, LCA is a framework, a framework for thinking, considering uh, what our options are. And it is, uh, it's a framework that is backed up by science and, and fact and data. Um, and it is also fortunately ready for integration into design tools, geometric design tools that, uh, that designers are, are generally more comfortable with. Now, this is the caveat. If you are not comfortable with, with geometric tools, uh, geometric modeling, modeling tools like SOLIDWORKS or Revit, you're not going to do anything with LCA. That's not going to happen. It can't. I mean, there's there are some uh, experiments with Rhino into Revit. Uh, these kinds of, of uh, interfaces are emerging as big data, as AI, all of these things, as as enormous uh, leaps forward in GPU processing, um, improve that kind of, of workflow and easy uh, integration into the design process. I think those. Um, the ease of maybe choosing and looking and evaluating among all these different criteria become much, much easier and much cheaper. So that's that, that's the other really big concern in speaking to, to professionals around the country about the, you know, their willingness to use these uh, different tools and different methodologies. Many are hesitant because they have to concern, concern themselves with the financial bottom line primarily. So. As as computation become, I mean, we just had this incredible lecture from um, uh, um, Don Greenberg on the the improvement of say that Moore's law brings in really making computation essentially free. As that is applied to these kinds of things, then we can answer the question. So we have all this this design technology, design in the certain, or rather, uh, technology in the service of, of design. The next question is, what do we do with it? How do we yoke these kinds of, of uh, technological marvels to actually influencing a better tomorrow for my daughter and for her friends? So, Urs, I just answered your question. Final. John, there is another question in the chat from Amy, and we have one minute left. Okay. Uh, let me see. I, I'm not seeing the chat here. I can maybe augment the, the question that, that Amy posed. I mean, she's saying this is a rather complex um, agenda. And then how do you introduce LCA in the curriculum? And I would kind of modify that question. It's like, how would you introduce it in the studio? What would you do? I, in fact, I, I, it's not a, a, a question that is you know, just a potential. We've done it. Uh, we have introduced it. It didn't go well uh, because the the fundamental framework of of questioning was not present so first you have to to prime people to say first of all this matters second of all it's not that difficult to to get right into this so the tools are the real way of of doing this andre's class uh i think probably has has been the most um uh committed uh, to that, but even they are, they struggled. Um, but these are the, the workflow issues are the way to get this method to go into the studio. You have to use tools. You basically should say, okay, you're using that tool. This is the, the plugin that you use to yield some kind of analysis through that. So it's, again, I'm presenting the, the overall topic. And you can drill down as deep as you'd like, but fundamentally use the tools. The data is tied to the tools. And you have to understand how to interpret the data, but even the interfaces and how the, the kinds of dashboard, uh, how those are, are evolving are improving. So it, it becomes more intuitive. It's really a matter of our working very hard to solve the problem for designers. So we design a solution for designers to use uh, and, and reduce that friction. It is a, it's an issue of friction and information and understanding. Thanks, John. Well, I guess we're one minute over. I really appreciate all of you showing up uh, online today. 
and uh, you know my my three uh, champions and tormentors, Urs, Tony, and Bronco. I I so appreciate everything you've done, and it's uh, it's you and my colleagues here that have made this uh, this book possible uh, with the help of the students, and I see some of them here today as well. So I I thank you all very very much. Thank you so much, John, for a very interesting presentation, and thank you everyone who attended this meeting. And our next book talk is in March, and it's going to be a book that, uh, written by our own alumnus, Mohammed El Shahed, about the architecture of Cairo. Thank you so much, and we're looking forward to see you again. And the last, last point is we have a uh, symposium, an international symposium on the same topic, uh, March 30th, 31st, and April 1st. So uh, stay tuned for information on that. It's in uh, conjunction with the American Center for Lifecycle Assessment and NJIT. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm.